I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming here and joining me for lunch today. I'd like to thank the law school for giving me this opportunity to present some of my uh, work. And let me begin by uh, sharing a little bit about um, how I think this talk is going to fit in to the theme of this lunch series, which is Chicago's uh, Best Ideas. Chicago has long traditions in the study of judicial deci decision making, comparative law, and uh, notably, of course, uh, economic analysis of law. What the many past and present practitioners in these areas have in common is an unwillingness to take laws, norms, and legal institutions as given. But instead they ask, how did they arise? How do they work? And how do they change? The ultimate motivation, of course, is that understanding these institutions is the first and most important step toward improving them. Now my work, including the work that I'll be uh, sharing with you here today, owes a special debt to Bill Landis, one of the pioneers of law and economics. Law and economics is most often associated, associated and perhaps in your minds as well, uh, with theory, with economic theory. But Professor Landis was one of the first to bring rigorous empirical analysis to test the predictions of theories about the law. And it's in that tradition uh, which Professor Landis established here and that empirical economists such as uh, our own Dean Miles, Professors uh, Milani and Dharmapala, and of course uh, Professor Landis himself continue to practice today. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is uh, share with you some of my uh, research on the Supreme Court of India. This is empirical uh, research that I am conducting with a couple of co-authors, Shido Kalantri at Cornell Law School and Aparna Chandra at the National Law University, Delhi. What we've done is we've collected the largest data set ever assembled on the Indian Supreme Court. It includes uh, 6,000 hand-coded judgments, opinions of the Indian Supreme Court from 2010 to 2015, and a machine-coded database of over one million uh, applications to the court, petitions and appeals uh, to the court over the last 25 years. We have supplemented this quantitative information with uh, qualitative uh, information that we've gathered from interviews with various stakeholders in the court, uh, most importantly, uh, Supreme Court justices themselves, other judges in the Indian system, Supreme Court uh, practitioners, members of the bar, academics, and court administrators. And the data that we've collected uh, gives us a wealth of information about the parties, their attorneys, the nature of the claims, where the cases came from, how long the cases spent in the Supreme Court, how the Supreme Court decided the cases, and how the opinions uh, are written. So over the next uh, uh, half an hour or so, I'll provide some background on the Indian Supreme Court, try to familiarize you a little bit with the court, share a little bit of the data that we've collected on the court, and then I'll talk at a little bit greater length about a couple of puzzles in the data that I've identified in the course of this uh, research and, uh, and what they might tell us about, about the empirical study of courts. And then at the end, I'm going to take a step back and ask a broader question about how looking at the differences in institutional design between the Indian Supreme Court and courts that we might be more familiar with uh, remind us not to take for granted the structure of, of the systems that we might be more familiar with. And it's that spirit of not taking things for granted that I think in some ways best connects this talk to the theme of Chicago's best ideas. So let me offer a little bit of motivation. Why would we want to take a look at the Indian Supreme Court? There's lots of courts in the world after all. Uh, here's an image that's been floating around the web uh, for some time. There are more people living inside this circle than outside of it. Uh, it certainly struck me when I saw that. Uh, it reminded me a little more generally, though, that not only is India an extremely uh, populous uh, country, uh, a country that's uh, uh, ever closer to the, the, uh, the economic and demographic center of gravity uh, on the surface of the earth, uh, but also that the uh, Indian Supreme Court is the apex court in the court system for the largest democracy in the world, for the largest country with a common law uh, legal tradition uh, in the world. 
more broadly, I think the empirical study of the Indian Supreme Court uh, lends several opportunities for, uh, for scholarly uh, insight. So how, how should we think about what data about a court might have to offer us? Well, first of all, there's, there's description. First and most obviously, there's description. There are simply facts about the court that no one yet knows, and collecting data will allow us uh, to, to learn those facts. There's inference. How do things affect each other? Does X cause Y? What are the mechanisms by which we see the patterns emerge that we see in the data? Of course, there's evaluation. Ultimately, we, we care about policy and about the direction that any given legal system is, is headed. And data gives us information and can provide tools for helping us uh, identify uh, implications for policy, uh, potential policy interventions, and the like. And finally, comparison. I think that there's value simply in looking at systems outside of our own that can not only uh, provide us with new perspectives on our own system, but we might learn something about how courts operate generally. Not necessarily something specific about one court or another court, but about how judges think generally that's useful uh, regardless of what particular court system we are a part of. So with all of that in mind, let me uh, uh, take uh, a few minutes to provide a little bit of background on the Supreme Court of India. I assume that uh, most of you are not familiar with it, and to provide a little bit of uh, a few snapshots of the data that we've co collected so far. The court is um, the apex court of a unitary court system. India has a unitary court system. There are no separate state and federal courts like in the United States. The Indian Supreme Court uh, has uh, been around since 1950. Uh, it, it first began hearing cases three years after independence. It's grown over time. It now has 31 seats uh, on the court. Uh, of them, I believe, currently 30 are filled. There are 30 justices of the Indian Supreme Court. And the court has an enormous caseload. They receive about 60,000 appeals and petitions uh, for hearing uh, per year. And they issue about 1,000 judgments on the merits every year. Now, there are 30 justices on the court, but they don't hear every case. They sit in benches, uh, panels as we call them uh, in the courts of appeals here, of either two, three, or five judges. How are the judges of the court selected? Well, there's what's called the collegium system for the appointment of judges. Under the Indian Constitution, judges are appointed by the president in consultation with the Chief Justice of India, but in practice the system is somewhat uh, different. Uh, what's emerged over time is a system whereby the four senior most members of the Supreme Court of India choose the judges to fill the vacancies on the Supreme Court. In other words, the court chooses its own members. Uh, there's mandatory retirement at age 65. Now, most judges are appointed in their 50s or even their early 60s, so this means the tenure of any individual Supreme Court justice may only be a few years. The Chief Justice is selected solely based on uh, seniority, so when the uh, Chief Justice retires at 65, whoever is the longest tenured uh, judge in terms of how long they've been on the Supreme Court becomes the next Chief Justice. The Chief Justice of the Indian Supreme Court has a lot of power. They determine the composition, the size, the subject matter of the benches of, of the court. So who sits with whom, how many judges are sitting on a bench, and what kinds of cases is this bench hearing? Are they constitutional cases? Are they tax cases? And so on. One of the things that the Supreme Court of India, considered by many to be the most powerful Supreme Court in the world, um, uh, one of the things that distinguishes it is the, the, the breadth of its jurisdiction. It has broad appellate and original jurisdiction. Uh, indeed, in our data, about 12% of the judgments are based on their original uh, jurisdiction. And uh, how do cases get to the court? Well, within the appellate jurisdiction, some cases are appeals as of right. Most cases uh, that come to the court through the appellate process uh, are within the discretionary appellate jurisdiction of the court. That's similar to the uh, writ of certiorari jurisdiction uh, in the US Supreme Court. It's called the special leave petition in India. Uh, but there's also uh, writ petitions. Writ petitions are a way to invoke the discretionary original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Uh, and those uh, uh, petitions uh, request the, the court's um, review of um, questions related to the fundamental rights under the Indian Constitution, often cases involving uh, and affecting the rights of many people. 
Uh, there's also something called a proceeding suo moto. This is where there is no pending lawsuit. Um, there is um, there is no uh, plaintiff trying to bring an action. It is the court itself initiating an action in the Supreme Court. Uh, suo moto, uh, the Supreme Court on its own initiative, uh, bringing an action. Now, I'll say a little bit about the SLP procedure. Uh, as I mentioned, something like 60,000 appeals and petitions are filed with the uh, Supreme Court uh, every year. How does the court handle such an enormous uh, volume of petitions? Two days out of every week in the court's calendar are actually devoted to deciding whether to admit or deny petitions for review, these, these special leave petitions. And on admission days, the judges will sit in panels, usually panels of two, but sometimes larger benches. Uh, they'll sit in their uh, benches and they'll hear uh, between 50 and 70 uh, petitions, uh, SLPs, per day, which means that some cases will have a total of, of two or five minutes of oral argument. Uh, but every petition receives oral argument. Nothing is done purely on the papers. The remainder of the week, three days out of the week, are devoted to uh, full-blown hearings on the merits of cases that have been admitted for, uh, for hearing. Uh, so I mentioned the different bench sizes uh, on the Supreme Court. Let me say a little bit about that. Um, so this is just a chart uh, based on our data. Uh, we've got three different bench sizes in the data, two, three, and five. Larger benches historically have been constituted, uh, but uh, over the last uh, many years, uh, the largest bench that's been constituted uh, contains uh, five justices. And if I'll just draw your attention to the, this first uh, row here. You see that the overwhelming majority of the cases in our data, we have about 6,500 cases in our data, the overwhelming majority of them, about 5,700 cases, or 87% of the cases in our data, uh, involve two judge benches. Uh, three judge benches and five judge benches are much less common. Five judge benches are a little bit more than 1% of the cases in our data. Now, if we focus just on cases involving a challenge to the constitutionality of executive or legislative action, these are the kinds of constitutional cases that we most often associate with the work of Supreme Courts and of, of constitutional courts around the world. Uh, what we see here is that, perhaps not surprisingly, um, these constitutional cases are disproportionately concentrated in five judge benches. The larger benches are often, about 40% uh, uh, about of the time, involve constitutional issues. But what I'll notice, because two judge benches are so prevalent and five judge benches are so rare, even though constitutional issues as a, in percentage terms are more, more common in five judge benches, the vast majority of Supreme Court rulings on constitutional issues are rendered by two judge benches. And so I think this is just a basic fact about the kinds of decisions that are being made by the Indian Supreme Court that I think really puts in, into high relief the contrast with the way that we've structured our own way of deciding, of having our Supreme Court decide constitutional issues, which of course is, it always sits um, as a bench of, of the whole court on banc. Just a few words about party characteristics, just to give you some flavor of things based on our data. Uh, the Indian Supreme Court uh, essentially exclusively serves Indian nationals. 99.8% of the parties in our data are Indian nationals. Among natural persons in our data, 87% of them uh, are male. Um, who are the plaintiffs and the defendants in our uh, data? Well, looking at civil cases, uh, of course, criminal cases, we know who the plaintiff's going to be. That's going to be the prosecution of the government. But in civil cases, uh, we have uh, who are the plaintiffs? Uh, usually individuals. Si about over 60% are individuals as opposed to institutions or the government um, or corporations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, defendants in civil cases, over half are, are the government, some organ of government, either uh, local or national government. Um, and wh who's bringing these cases to the court? Is it the plaintiffs in the lower court cases petitioning the court for review? Is it the defendants? Well, it's about half and half, it turns out. Um, a comment about the Supreme Court bar. So there are two tiers of membership, uh, so to speak, in the Supreme Court bar. There are advocates, that's just a generic term for people who litigate uh, in, in court. And there are senior advocates. This is a special designation conferred by the Supreme Court itself upon a particularly uh, uh, um, uh, 
recognized members of, of the Supreme Court Bar. It's a prestigious designation. And senior advocates tend to command uh, quite handsome fees for their uh, uh, service before the Supreme Court if they're in private practice. Of course, some senior advocates uh, work for government. Um, you know, the Solicitor General, for example, would be categorized in our data as a senior advocate. Um, and you'll notice what I've uh, shown in this chart here is how they tend to match up. If you just look at plaintiffs and defendants in the data, you can do it similarly looking at appellants and appellees, you'd get the same pattern. What you see here is that cases that have an advocate representing the plaintiff tend also to have an advocate representing the defendant and likewise with, with senior advocates. So there's this kind of self-selection or sorting in the data where it seems like certain cases attract the attention of the, of the big bucks lawyers perhaps because they're higher stakes cases or they involve um, a more powerful clients or something like that. But that's a pattern that I'll, I'll return to in just a little bit. I'll speak briefly about case outcomes. That's the bottom line after all. What we see is a little bit less than 60% of uh, all uh, uh, merits judgments involve the Supreme Court reversing the decision below. That's a little bit lower than the fraction in the US Supreme Court, but of course there's no reason that they would necessarily be the same, same percentage. Um, and the rates are a little bit different in civil cases and criminal cases. The court more often reverses in civil cases than criminal cases, and that's a pattern I'll, I'll say a little bit more about uh, uh, later on. Uh, what are the opinions of the court look like? Well, they tend to be about nine pages on average. Uh, double that if you're talking about a case with constitutional issues. Not surprising that the, the fancy uh, constitutional cases get uh, more attention in terms of the opinion writing. Um, out of the 5,000 or so opinions that decide our 6,000 or so cases in the data, about 4,000 of them, of them are signed opinions. In other words, there's a, a, a single justice attributed as the author of that opinion. The rest are essentially per curiam opinions. Now, um, given that we have about 4,000 signed opinions, how often do we see concurrences and dissents? Uh, in our six years of data, in our uh, 5,000 some odd uh, opinions, we have 58 concurring opinions and 29 dissenting opinions, an extremely low rate of separate opinion writing, especially for those of us uh, familiar with reading US Supreme Court opinions. Um, and it's not just that uh, dissent and concurrence is rare um, among cases, it's also uh, rare among justices. Um, if you uh, look at the 58 concurring Opinions, what you see is that six justices in our data out of the 63 justices who served for some or all of the time period of our data, six out of the 63 account for more than half of all concurring opinions, and four out of the 63 justices account for more than half of all of the dissenting opinions. So there's, there's a relatively small number of justices even who account for that very small number of, of separate opinions. Um, so this just breaks it down by bench size just to give you a little bit more flavor. You do see that in five judge benches you get up to a, a whopping 10% of opinions have a separate opinion. Only about 5% of five judge benches have a dissent even. Um, I do wonder uh, uh, why we see any concurrences or dissents in two judge benches, but you, you occasionally see them. Uh, very, very rare. Um, uh, you know, these are hand-coded, so I'm, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some of those are, uh, are, are, uh, are mistakes, but, um, uh, um, but you could imagine uh, certainly concurring opinions even in a two-judge two bench. Um, and a case where there is a dissent, by the way, in case you're wondering, in cases where there is a dissent in a two-judge two bench, uh, you'll see that case get elevated to a three-judge bench uh, for a tie-breaking decision. Okay. Um, uh, so just to uh, point out a, a couple of things here. So you see here, um, there's a large number of procuring opinions at, at, uh, across the board here. And of course, as I mentioned, relatively small numbers of concurrences and dissents, even in the larger benches, um, not just the small uh, benches. And finally, an obligatory uh, com uh, comparison, even though I will hasten to add, this is an apples to oranges comparison. There's no reason why data from the Indian Supreme Court should look anything like data from the US Supreme Court or vice versa. Uh, but just to, as a point of comparison, if you compare six years of Indian data to one year of US Supreme Court data, uh, you have 4,000 signed majority opinions in India, 66 signed majority opinions in the US. But of course, uh, out of those 66, you have 66 majority opinions in the 2014 term. You actually have 71 dissenting opinions. You have more dissenting opinions than majority opinions uh, in the 2014 term for the US Supreme Court. But of course, a dissent rate of about um, uh, less than 1%. OK. Um, 
So let, let me talk in a little bit uh, of uh, more detail, I'll try to be quick, about two puzzles uh, in, in the data. Uh, some of the sort of normative questions or, or, or uh, analytical uh, questions that this data might, might help inform. So the first is there's a couple of competing narratives in academic circles, in policy circles in India about what it is exactly that the Indian Supreme Court is doing on, on an on a everyday level. Is, is, is the norm docket inclusion or docket exclusion. If you talk to Supreme Court justices, certainly every Supreme Court justice uh, uh, I talk to, I talk to a handful of them, um, they are unanimous in their description of what they think their work is. They see their mission as providing a day in court to the underdog in Indian litigation. They see their job as providing access um, to uh, disadvantaged groups to see that justice is done in their individual cases. Um, they are trying to correct um, errors at the individual level as they find them. Um, on the other hand, some people have looked at some uh, aggregate data, not as detailed as our data, but there is some aggregate data out there, and concluded that it looks like the court is actually favoring uh, not individual civil plaintiffs, but corporate civil defendants, not uh, individual crimin uh, criminal defendants, but the government, the prosecution in criminal cases. Well, the data present presents us with kind of an interesting uh, set of information. If you look across all cases, plaintiffs and defendants uh, both win about 60% of the time, a little bit less than 60% of the time when they appeal, not much of a difference. But if you break it down by civil and criminal, you see an interesting pattern. When civil, I'm sorry, when criminal plaintiffs, in other words, the prosecution, the government, when they appeal, they win more than 60% of the time. But when a criminal defendant appeals to the court, he wins uh, only about 50% of the time. A big difference in win rates between the prosecution and the defense in criminal cases. Let's take a look at civil cases. Um, Plaintiffs in civil cases win less than 60% of the time. Defendants in civil cases win more than 60% of the time. It's these patterns that have led some people to conclude that the Supreme Court, despite its protestations to the contrary, is biased in favor of uh, Goliath rather than David, so to speak, is biased against the underdog. Um, but I think we should sound a note of caution at this point. After all, we should pay attention to the institutional context in which the court's merits judgments are being made. There's a two-stage process in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court chooses which cases to decide, and then it decides them. How are we to make inferences about the court's bias by looking at its merits decisions when the court itself chooses which cases to decide? Here's the logic in my view. If the court is saying to itself, should we take this case? or not take this case? Should we grant this petition for review or simply deny it and not decide it on the merits? The court's gonna look at the individual case and say, look, are we gonna reverse in this case? Does this look like the kind of case that deserves our attention? Is this the kind of case where we're likely to reverse or are we very unlikely to reverse and it's not worth us spending a lot of our time reviewing this decision? If that's how the court's thinking, now ask yourself, how does bias, either in favor or against the underdog, affect the admissions process. Let's say that it's true that the justices are biased in favor of the underdog. They do want to give access to justice to the criminal defendant and the civil plaintiff. Well, they're gonna look at a, at a, at a civil uh, appeal, a civil uh, petition from some big fancy corporate defendant, and they're gonna say, well, you know what? Unless you have a really strong case on the merits, if you, if, unless we feel compelled to reverse, you know what, uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna disturb the decision below. But then they see some, some hapless civil plaintiff or some hapless criminal defendant whose appeal maybe isn't so strong, but they, they have a shot, they have a shot at getting reversed, and they say, you know what, we're gonna take this appeal just in case we end up reversing this case. Now that to me sounds like giving the underdog their day in court. But how's that gonna show up in this data if you only take cases from the big guys when they're really, 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 really likely to win their request for reversal. But you're willing to take cases from the little guys even when they don't necessarily have the strongest argument. Well, what you're gonna see is the win rates 
for the prosecution or for civil defendants are going to be higher than the win rates for civil plaintiffs and criminal defendants. So I think once you take into account the fact that the court isn't just deciding the merits of the cases it accepts, but it's deciding which cases to accept, it changes how we think about the data. Here's another question. How much is a lawyer worth? Right? A question perhaps on, on our minds from time to time. Um, <laughs> And it's, um, and it's certainly a question for us. There's lots of anecdotal evidence supporting the view that, wow, it's really worth getting a lawyer who's more experienced, a lawyer who is you know, uh, more prestigious in some sense, or if you're in private practice, a lawyer that, that bills at higher rates, uh, because you think you're, you're going to be more likely to get what you want as a client. Uh, the hard thing from an empiricist point of view um, is that it's actually very hard to identify um, quantitatively, empirically, that higher priced or more prestigious lawyers actually are more likely to succeed. Um, because after all, uh, look, look at senior advocates versus advocates in the Indian Supreme Court. Let's say senior advocates have higher win rates. Does that mean that they're, they're better in some sense than, than a regular advocates? Well, maybe they just have clients that have more resources, that are more tenacious. Maybe they just get stronger cases to start with, and their higher w win rate is just a reflection of the fact they get stronger cases to start with. So maybe higher win rates of senior advocates relative to advocates, even if we find that in the data, it's ambiguous. But OK, well, what if they're actually just the same win rate? Does that disprove that they're, they're, they're better at winning? Well, maybe, but we saw before that senior advocates tend to be matched up with other senior advocates, and advocates tend to be matched up with other advocates. So if, if my senior advocate is giving me an advantage, well, my opponent's senior advocate is giving them an advantage, and they're just going to cancel each other out. And so it could be that if we see no difference between senior advocates and advocates in the data, that's also ambiguous. Maybe senior advocates aren't worth the money. On the other hand, maybe they are worth the money, but they just cancel each other out, and that's what we see in the data. So how on earth can we identify whether senior advocates uh, actually, actually are more effective than advocates? Um, well, what if senior advocates have lower win rates than advocates? What do we infer from that? Uh, well, before answering that question, let's ask if that's an, even an empirically relevant question to ask. Here are the win rates. These are the win, win rates of the appellant on the merits based on who the lawyers are. So let's look at the effect of, of, of an appellee moving from an advocate to a senior advocate. Now notice, these are appellant win rates, so the appellee wants a lower number, right? The appellee wants a lower number. So if the appellant has an advocate, let's compare what happens to appellees with advocates versus senior advocates. The, the win rate for the appellant falls by 12%, a huge drop, and that's what we might expect if, if senior advocates are effective at winning cases. But as we discussed, it's ambiguous. Maybe senior advocates just get better cases. Maybe they have tougher clients. Likewise, if we look at, at this row, moving from advocate to senior advocate among appellees, you see another 10 percentage point drop in the appellant's win rate, consistent with senior advocates being effective, but it doesn't prove anything because it could just be senior advocates get, get better cases. Now let's look at the appellant, moving from advocate to senior advocate for appellants. If, you're, if your opponent has an advocate and you move from advocate to senior advocate as an appellant, your win rate drops. Do you see that? Your win rate goes down by 5% relative to having an advocate. What about if your opponent has a senior advocate? Same story. <coughs> Going from advocate to senior advocate, your win rate drops. So perhaps lawyers aren't worth much. <laughs> now. I have an incentive to disagree with that hypothesis, of course, um, but, um, and I'll tell you um, why I think that hypothesis is, is wrong. Um, not only do I find it implausible based on anecdotal evidence, um, uh, certainly implausible based on anecdotal evidence not just in the US, but specifically in the Supreme Court of India as well. Um, but here's why. Again, let's think about the process by which lawyers might influence the court. They don't just argue cases on the merits. They also petition the court to take their case in the first place. And there's something that separates senior advocates for appellants from senior advocates for appellees. And that is this. At the initial stage of the admissions process, it's ex parte. 
only the representative of the appellant has any influence on whether the petition survives to the next stage of the process. The appellee is not involved. So here's my hypothesis. Senior advocates are better at getting borderline petitions admitted. It's an ex parte process, so we don't expect to see any effect from the appellee senior advocate. But we do expect to see an effect from a senior advocate for the appellant being able to convince the court to take a case that's otherwise borderline. But of course, again, if senior advocates are getting all these like questionable borderline cases before the court on the merits, well, we would expect that to have a negative effect on their win rate on the merits because they're, they're just getting these cases to have a shot at winning, even if they don't necessarily end up winning. So perhaps the greatest value of a senior advocate, at least in this context, is just getting the court to hear the case on the merits at all. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. A, a hearing on the merits in the Indian Supreme Court might last hours or days, but a hearing at the admission stage in the Supreme Court might last two or three minutes. And you might think to yourself, when you have that little time to convince a court, skill at oral advocacy and maybe just star power might actually have an effect on, on a court's decision. Some of the top uh, senior advocates in the Indian Supreme Court bar um, are, are basically rock stars. Uh, these folks pull down eight-figure uh, annual uh, income. I don't mean eight figure in rupees, I mean eight fi figures in US dollars. Um, these, these, these folks are rock stars and I think this is some evidence of, of why in fact uh, they, um, they, they get paid so much. Um, so again, the first stage of the admissions process is ex parte. That's why we see this effect only for appellants counsel. I think that's what's, what's neat about this feature of the data and the institutional context in which it comes from. And you know, this is kind of a, a law version maybe of, of the saying in medicine, you know, the best surgeons lose the most patients. It's because they get the toughest cases and, and, and you know, they're, they're able to, to do something about the hardest cases. All right, so I don't want to take too much more time, but I do want to uh, uh, begin to, to, to zoom back and think a little bit bigger picture here. So takeaways from these, this more detailed discussion, I think, is just data is important, but the inferences we draw from data have to be informed by our understanding of the details of the institutional environment. And I think this is kind of putting the law in law and economics. We have to really understand what it is that lawyers are doing and how legal institutions work before we can uh, really uh, dissect what the data tell us about them. Um, and in, more generally, you know, people throw around data about win rates, you know, how often does a court decide in favor of this group or that group, and this is just a cautionary note that maybe we can't quite infer quite as much as we want to uh, from that kind of data. But now let me turn to, to broader thoughts on institutional, on institutional design. You know, I think the unique structure and practices of the Indian Supreme Court really kind of forces us to confront some of the, the institutional details of our own courts um, that we might otherwise take, take for granted. And as we think about the design of any court system, whether it's ours or someone else's, we want to ask the following questions. You know, are these design choices deliberate? Uh, what, um, uh, you know, what are the consequences of these design choices? And, and are the effects, good or bad, contingent on the context. Are design choices that really make sense for one legal system a really bad idea for another legal system? Um, where do these design choices come from? Are they exogenous or endogenous? In other words, were they imposed on the court, perhaps by some constitutional provision or something like that? Or did the court develop these norms on its own? Did the court create these norms itself um, through, uh, you know, through its own experience or, or because of the incentives created by the court structure? And how do these design choices affect each other? Is it that we can kind of study them individually on an a la carte basis, or do we have to think about them in a more bundled form? It could be that you know, two individual details of court design individually might not be such a great idea, but perhaps together they, they actually make sense. They, there's some synergies that, to be identified between details of institutional design. So let me just mention some of these design choices that, that sprang to mind as, as, as I thought about um, some of the data that I've been working with uh, in this project. What's a court to do? What, what's its mission? Is it error correction? Is it fixing mistakes below, saying this case was wrongly decided, now it's rightly decided? Or is it norm elaboration? Is it saying we are going to announce broad rules that will dictate how cases 
future cases decided by other courts uh, will be decided. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that the, the U.S. Supreme Court has made a, a, a fairly stark choice between these two things. Um, and it seems that the Indian Supreme Court has made a very different choice. And we might want to ask, ask uh, you know, why that is. Um, life tenure versus mandatory retirement, that's, um, uh, th that's uh, uh, an important difference. I might say a little bit more about it if I have a few minutes at the end. Um, executive appointment versus a collegium system. Um, en banc hearings versus smaller benches. I mean, we're used to the, the setting of a Supreme Court sitting en banc for every merits decision, but that's actually not the norm internationally. Um, how do we divide a court's uh, attention between original and appellate jurisdiction? Do we make its jurisdiction mandatory or discretionary? And what about this concept of suo-moto actions? It's kind of exotic, but maybe it's worth thinking about. How, what do we think of those? Um, and of course, sort of the obvious questions that spring to mind, I mean, how many judges? There's nothing inevitable about nine. Um, how many judgments? Maybe the US Supreme Court decides too few cases. Uh, maybe the Indian Supreme Court decides too many. Maybe not. Um, so let me just say a, a couple of thoughts uh, about, uh, about these before I, um, I, I, I conclude my remarks and I invite questions. Um, when we think about, for example, error correction versus norm uh, elaboration, and we look at a court like the Indian Supreme Court that decides you know, a thousand cases on the merits um, every year, we might ask ourselves, um, uh, why is it taking this case-by-case -case approach where it's taking lots and lots of cases and deciding them in a very individualized, fact-specific way? Um, you know, what, what, what we sometimes hear from justices is, well, you know, we, we just, it's very hard for us to exercise control over the lower courts. Uh, we need to correct them. They make mistakes all the time. And I think it's a fair question to ask, are the lower courts out of control because the Supreme Court isn't giving them broad rules, isn't elaborating norms for them to follow? Or is the court focused on individual case-by-case -case error correction because the lower courts are out of control. We don't even know what, what's the chicken or what's the egg here. Um, and, I, and I think it's questions like those that are worth, um, worth exploring. Uh, you know, we, we, when we think about life tenure versus mandatory retirement, you know, that's a, that's a question we, we're all very aware of. Uh, we understand some of the obvious pros and cons. Life tenure, the judges are more independent. Right? We don't have to worry about incentives to try to get jobs after they retire. On the other hand, we worry about judges, you know, maybe as they age, you know, their, their energy or their faculties begin to decline. But there are other effects that I think are worth thinking about. Um, for example, how do we think about a judge's decision to invest in the institution or to invest in the creation of norms in an institution? If you're going to be a judge on the court for the next 18 months, how does that change your outlook about things like collegiality, about the trade-off between error <coughs> correction and norm elaboration, versus if your outlook is the next 18 years? Um, how does this affect your decision to admit a case at the admission stage, when usually the time to judgment on the merits is three or four years in the Supreme Court? Most judges who make the admissions decision aren't on the court when the court makes the merits decision. How does that affect how you decide cases? Um, and, uh, and so on. I just want to give you a flavor of some of the, the interesting questions that kind of come out of confronting these institutional design choices, things that we might otherwise uh, take for granted. But in the interest of time, and because I'd love to hear uh, your questions uh, about these topics, um, I'll stop there. So thank you very much. executive appointment versus collegium system, how that works. Do you think that that has any relationship to how many, how few dissents and concurrences there are? Or like because they're choosing their own, it's self-selection. Right, what right. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that's certainly my working hypothesis is exactly uh, what you said. How do we think about the difference between, uh, you know, executive appointment versus the collegium system? Does this relate to how few separate opinions we see in, in the data? I would guess so you, you worry that over time, 
um, you end up with a very homogeneous group of judges constituting the Supreme Court. And um, you know, they just, they all, if they're all like-minded, why would they dissent, right? Why would you dissent if, you know, and if you're, if you're picking people who, who kind of look at the world the same way that, uh, you know, that, that you do. So I, I certainly think as, as a working hypothesis that the collegium system um, has an effect on, on exactly that, on, the, on the, the extent to which we see dissent within the court. And, and I think, you know, it, it's, it's important to, to, to keep that in mind because the, 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 the first order concern that everyone, um, uh, has, has debated, it, certainly in the Indian context, but I think it's relevant everywhere, um, is, you know, how independent do we want judges to be? Do we want them to be representative of the, of sort of the political process, or do we want them to be independent from it? And that's an obvious distinction between executive appointment and, and the collegium system, but I think there are these other, other effects, right, of these design choices, and I think that's a great example of, of one of those, um, uh, of, of one of those effects, which is, uh, you know, you might think, and, and I think the argument is both ways, but you know, India, like the U.S., is, is a very heterogeneous country, politics, very fractious. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you might say, well, on the one hand, maybe there's something to be said for a branch of government where everybody just kind of gets along and there's no dissent. On the other hand, you might say, look, this is nonsense. Like, they're just in an echo chamber where they're not hearing conflicting views on how to approach, how to approach cases like this. So, um, yeah, I think Normatively, I'm not sure how to think about it, which way that cuts, but, but I think that's exactly the, the right kind of question um, to be asking about, about these kinds of uh, uh, institutional uh, characteristics. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you mentioned that the judges tend to specialize in mm -hmm. certain areas of law, like acts. Do you think that has any effect on their rulings? Do you think that, does, does it appear that there might be a benefit from having a large panel of judges wearing a few specialized in different areas mm -hmm. versus the all judges generalized approach that the United mm -hmm. States takes? Yeah, fair question. So to the extent, the extent to which there's specialization by subject matter area among justices, um, it, it's not quite as clean cut maybe as, I, as it, it, it may have sounded earlier, um, the, the benches are reassigned every six months. And so it's kind of up to the Chief Justice whether you know, he just keeps giving you all the tax cases and whether you like it or not, or maybe because you like it, you, know, you just keep getting the tax cases, right? Uh, so uh, in, you know, for the most part, the judges are generalists in the same sense that the judge, justices, uh, the judges of the US Supreme Court are generalists. They, they are kind of expected to decide whatever you know, shows up in their, uh, on their docket. Um, but you know, to some extent, the justices of the US Supreme Court do specialize. You know, as a civ pro person, I think of some justices as more sort of civ pro wonks than others. And, and I, there certainly is that on the, on the Indian Supreme Court um, uh, too. So I think there are a couple of things that, that may go into this. One is the Chief Justice is assigning judges based on some specialization to try to be more efficient. Um, the other is, you know, there's been some data that suggests when the Chief Justice is sitting on, um, on a panel, uh, even relative to the low baseline rate of dissents, the Chief Justice is almost never uh, outside of the majority. And you might think, well, you know, if you get to choose who's on the on the panel with you, and you get to assign yourself what you think are the most important cases, you're going to make sure that you're in the majority of the panel on the most important cases. So, um, so you know, that's not so much maybe about specialization, but really a, a kind of highlights, I think, in some sense, the, 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 the power that agenda control gives to the, the Chief Justice. And that, I mean, the Chief Justice has a tremendous amount of power in the US Supreme Court as well. I think this is, this is not unique at all to India, but it, there's certainly a lot of questions like that that come out of, uh, come out of these observations, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for your analysis, uh, Professor. Very interesting, actually. Uh, you mentioned that it's a you know, apple versus orange com comparison. And I'm wondering that the population of India is like around 1.3 billion, mm -hmm. which is probably no, no, nothing compared to the population of you know US. How do you think the population has an effect on you know how Supreme Courts work in both the countries? Yeah, great, a uh, great question. Um, I think in some ways the answer depends on what we th what we think or what, what the court thinks it, its vision for itself is. So you might think a norm elaborating court, doesn't matter whether the country has 1.3 billion people or 1.3 thousand people in it, every country has to have laws and those laws need to be elaborated over time and so the court's just going to elaborate those laws. 
Uh, on the other hand, you know, to the extent that um, there is an error correction component to what a court is doing, it really makes a difference uh, how many cases there are in the system that potentially could contain errors, right? And so if you look at the, at the high courts, uh, which are the equivalent uh, in the hierarchy to the courts of appeals uh, in the United States, the high courts in the Indian system, uh, the high courts decide 1.2 million cases per year. That's not the trial courts. That's not the district court level, which is uh, you know, an order of magnitude more than that. This is the, the, the 1.2 million appeals per year are being decided by um, the, the, the Indian court system. And so you might think to yourself, just by sheer force of numbers, I mean, this is an enormous court system, uh, and it's a unitary court system. You know, the U.S., there's, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's not one, really one Supreme Court in a sense. You might say, well, actually, there's, you know, there's, there's more than 50 Supreme Courts in the U.S. in some sense, um, because the court of last resort for most questions of state law is going to be a, a state Supreme Court. And, and, uh, and then maybe the differences aren't so stark. You know, you say, well, the Supreme Courts of the United States are deciding more than 1,000 cases per year, and they comprise many more than 30 justices. Um, but again, I think it comes back to this question of, if we're asking ourselves, well, are these courts engaged in error correction or, or norm elaboration, we can't really count all 50 states separately for purposes of normal aberration because the, the normal aberration duties of each state are redundant, right? It's just they're separate jurisdictions. They're separate sovereigns. So they're doing the same work twice because they're, they have their individual laws. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think it, 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 it's, a, it's a hard question. I think, you know, um, it is very important to keep in mind that India is a much bigger country in terms of population than the U.S. and it's a unitary court system. So the Supreme Court just has much more <laughs> in its bailiwick than, than the U.S. Supreme Court uh, does for that reason. And so I, I do think it is in many ways an apples to oranges comparison. But nonetheless, thinking about it, I do think highlights the extent to which a lot might turn on whether we think we, we want to focus on norm elaboration versus error correction, how much work in terms of how many cases, how many judges um, we, we expect a court to be doing. So yeah, maybe some over on this side. Uh, yeah. How does the court deal with the question of precedent? Because if you want to overturn a precedent, but you, you're on a panel of two or three judges, and there's 27 others who may disagree with you. So that that's an interesting question that we are we are in the process of exploring right now. So we had our 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 coders code a case for whether or not precedent was being overturned based upon the head, the head notes. Um, uh, it's, you know, in, in the reporter, kind of like, you know, the reporters we have here have head notes, the, the reporters that the, the coders were using had head notes too, and whether or not the, the head notes coded the case as overruling some prior precedent. And, uh, you know, technically under the, the Supreme Court's own rules, um, a two-judge bench can never overturn precedent. Uh, it has to be at, at least a three-judge bench to overturn uh, a two-judge bench and a five-judge bench to overturn a three-judge bench's precedent and so on all the way up to, to the max. Um, but if you look at the data, it is true that two-judge benches very rarely overturn precedent and five-judge benches are more likely to overturn precedent. But of course, almost 90% of cases are two-judge benches. So in terms of absolute numbers of cases, most of the precedent being overturned is being overturned by two judge benches, which technically is, is not even permitted under the Supreme Court's own rules. So is this because the reporters have a different concept of what it means to overturn precedent than the court itself? You know, perhaps. Uh, is this, an, is this a, a consequence of the fact that, you know, you're only on the court for a few years, you sit in benches of two, which means you might not ever sit with one of your colleagues during your entire career as a justice of the Supreme Court. You may not have any idea what their judicial philosophy is. You may have no idea what opinions they've written that might be relevant to your opinions. Uh, you know, when your court is producing you know, 10,000 pages of new precedent every year, are you even reading your own court's you know, uh, output? Um, I don't know if it's, if it's possible, given the amount of work these, these justices have to do. They have an enormous amount of work. I mean, they are working around the clock. Um, so, you know, one does wonder what effect the, the, so the design of this institution, separate benches, so many judges, so many cases, has on the ability of any given panel or any given bench of judges to make their individual decision cohere, right, with the body of precedent that, that, that's come before. I think that's, 
that's a, a real challenge for this uh, court. I mean, we see, you know, in a court that decides only 70 cases a year, you know, we argue about whether they're following their own precedent, right? And so, um, uh, so you could imagine that, you know, the, 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 the consequences that this might have for, uh, for precedent. But I think that that's a real challenge that the, that the court faces. And y one might ask, you know, um, is there focus on the individual facts and circumstances of each appeal? Is that a cause of doctrinal incoherence, or is that a way of coping with doctrinal incoherence? You know, again, I, I think that's an open, that's an open question. So, uh -huh. yeah. could you uh, say a little bit more about the Suomoto actions? Like, what kind of cases uh, the court hears on this doctrine? If there are any um, sort of balance of power concerns, yeah. because it seems almost like a legislative. Body and just yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's 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 very uh, it's very rare, um, and so writ petitions and suomoto actions are, are really, you know, unique or, 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 or close to unique in, in the Indian system in that uh, these are original actions in the in the Supreme Court suomoto actions, especially because they're initiated by the court itself, um, that attempt to address some sort of. Um, systemic uh, problem, some problem that affects a large number of people that relates to, um, you know, the, the fundamental rights, uh, uh, in, you know, individual rights, human rights enshrined in the Constitution. Um, and so um, I, I, you know, I'm probably going to get the, the writ petitions and the suomoto petitions uh, mixed up if I try to remember individual examples of this. But the court has done things like, um, you know, set air quality standards for a particular matter in the city of Delhi. Um, you know, the Supreme Court has um, raised questions about uh, whether the um, appellate hierarchy of uh, the Indian court system should be changed to, to create a new uh, group of courts of appeals, for example. Um, you know, these are the kinds of questions that you couldn't imagine at least the United States Supreme Court raising on its own or even entertaining um, from, from, from a party that comes to it. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's, a dramatic, um, it's a dramatic difference. Um, it, it, I'm sure to an American lawyer, at least to myself, it, it was flabbergasting to me when I first uh, heard about it. Um, you know, given the norms we have, you know, uh, the, the case or controversy requirement and so on, it's not clear it would even be constitutional. If we wanted to do it in the U.S., we might think, oh boy, this is undemocratic. These are not only unelected judges, but these are judges that aren't even appointed by elected, elected people. Uh, it's worth noting, though, that the Indian Supreme Court um, is the most popular institution in the Indian government. It's the most popular public institution in the Indi Indian government. Um, has been, has l for long been considered the most legitimate institution in, the, in, in terms of popular opinion uh, in the Indian government. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, interesting. Um, and I guess the, the, the deeper, more, uh, more, more legal question about it is, if, if all the Supreme Court is doing is simply deciding an individual case on the specific facts before it, well, it should wait for that case to arrive and it should decide it when it arrives. But if we think that part of what an apex court is doing is announcing laws of general applicability, rules of general applicability that uh, determine conduct for you know, people throughout the country, we might ask ourselves, is the best way for a court to make those decisions, making them in the context of a case that came to it, that it had no control over the circumstances or timing of the case, right? Uh, we might think to itself, if the court's making rules that have a legislative character to it, maybe it should take more of a legislative approach to, to approaching the question. I mean, the Congress, right? Congress will initiate things, it'll hold hearings, right? And we, we say, well, that's a, that's, that's a good thing. It doesn't just randomly, like, whatever comes its way, it just says yes or no, right? We say, oh, it's good that they're proactive and that they hold hearings and they, they investigate. So, you know, uh, again, I, I am, was completely taken aback when I heard about Suomoto actions, but I'm trying to keep an open mind, right? I'm trying to keep an open mind about it and ask, you know, what is it, what institutional need is this institutional detail responding to? What is it addressing? And you know, uh, one of the things that has typified um, the elected branches of Indian politics is a fair amount of gridlock. Uh, um, you know, it's changed over time, of course, but you know, I think a lot of people see the Supreme Court's willingness to be assertive um, as, as responsive to uh, chronic gridlock in, in the elected branches. 
You know, and, and whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I, I need to learn a lot more before I started to make those kinds of judgments. Um, but it at least uh, provokes the question of, um, of how do we think, in general, courts should respond to circumstances in, in other branches of government. Should they just keep blinders on and, and just be, we're just judges and we're just deciding cases, or should they attempt to adjust their role as, as other branches change their roles? You know, I, I, that's, that's, you know, raises the question. Uh, it certainly doesn't settle the answer, but I think um, the juxtaposition, again, of, of two systems that are so radically different in their approach to what is a, is a, is a case that the court is allowed to decide um, uh, points us in the direction of potentially, you know, creative possibilities. Yeah. So, uh -huh. with respect to the mandatory retirement, um, I mean, I suppose you could kind of speculate about the reasons behind it. Um, one could be that you know, to, it's to keep the, the Supreme Court stock with sort of fresh and energetic judges. But mm -hmm. can you infer either from the data or have you read any discussions about concerns of say? or other other kinds of like structural concerns um, beyond just sort of keeping things fresh and uh, yeah you know so I, I'm not sure what the original concerns were that motivated it uh, mandatory retirement uh, is not uncommon you know again I think you know the things that we think of as sort of you know, obvious and inevitable when we look at the federal courts are, are by no means um, uh, uh, typical uh, when we look even at state courts, let alone other countries' courts. Um, but in any event, uh, yeah, you might think maybe just, you know, we want fresh blood uh, uh, in, in the system. You, you worry that as people get older, um, you know, their, 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 their ability to, to decide lots of cases declines and so on. You know, there's, there's certainly a debate you know, when you look at Supreme Court history about, uh, about justices who got to a point where they simply weren't healthy enough to, to continue to, to function at the level they were functioning at, but they did not retire. And so, um, you know, that, that's a real concern that um, uh, mandatory retirement may, may address. Um, having said that, it, you know, if the, if the concern is fresh blood, it's not clear that that's how it's played out. I mean, the, the judges that get selected are judges that have, um, you know, long uh, been in the system. Um, they're almost uniformly selected from high courts, uh, you know, elevated from high courts to the Supreme Court. Um, late in their careers, they, you know, they, they, they serve relatively uh, a short terms. And there isn't a, a um, and, and as we see from the dissent data, there certainly isn't any sort of norm of rocking the boat among among the justices, so um, so it's not clear that it, to the extent that was a, a purpose that it, that the, that the, that design choice has, has served that purpose. Um, you may have a more you know you, you may develop a, a completely different hypothesis about mandatory retirement, especially in an era where 65 isn't actually particularly old. Um, where do these judges go after they retire? Um, and uh, you know what kind of pensions do they have? It turns out uh, judges get a, a huge amount of in-kind compensation. They'll have uh, these enormous compounds in the center of Delhi. They'll have you know two or three drivers and two or three cars. Um, but in terms of the, their actual money that they get paid as a salary, in other words, stuff they can put away uh, as a nest egg for retirement is is actually not that much. Um, so it's almost inevitable that they will pursue employment after they retire. And it's worth noting that it's almost inevitable that the employment they pursue upon retirement from the Supreme Court is with the, the national government. And so, you know, one might think that that um, creates a set of incentives um, that's different from the set of incentives uh, created by, by life tenure. And, and so that's something that actually we're, we're hoping to explore in our, in our research uh, as we go forward. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. How are judges selected to the lower courts that gets them eventually to the Supreme Court? Oh, that's, uh, uh, not not elected. Um, it, it's a it's a uh, career judiciary. Uh, so unlike the U.S., where you kind of have a different career, right, and then you become a very prominent lawyer, or 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 uh, uh, you know you're working in government, and then you get appointed to become a district court judge or an appellate court judge. Um, here, people will uh, be judges their whole life, um, and um, uh, but you know, to be honest, I, I, I will have to uh, 
I will have to confess uh, a degree of ignorance here. I, I have not reviewed that information recently, and I, I can't remember the details of it. So I don't want to continue saying things that may be that may be misleading or erroneous. But yeah. Let me follow up. Yeah. Very quick question: Is uh, the election of Prime Minister Modi an impact on the judicial system, particularly the Supreme Court, in terms of its direction? Is he politicized? Not politicized? Yeah. So I can say a little bit about that. I, I, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, so. So one thing that has happened is the, uh, uh, the, the new administration and the parliament uh, passed a law attempting to reinstate the executive appointment uh, process. And so the idea being that uh, rather th to dismantle the collegium system, in other words. Um, and so the legislation would, would return to the, the kind of the textual um, uh, uh, rule uh, that the, the president appoints in consultation with, uh, with the Supreme Court. Um, the constitutionality um, of that uh, uh, amendment, constitutional amendment, I guess, uh, was litigated. And the Supreme Court held that that uh, was unconstitutional. Um, now, you might ask yourself how a constitutional amendment could be unconstitutional, but I India has this very um, uh, 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 special doctrine um, called, the, uh, I believe it's called the Basic Structure Doctrine. And the idea is that there is kind of a meta-constitution uh, that is implicit in the Constitution, which is there are certain things, there are certain changes to the Constitution that you cannot make uh, because the Constitution is based upon a, a basic set of structures that are, um, you know, inherent in what it means to be India, and uh, and so any any attempt to um, disturb the constitutional balance too dramatically is is uh, considered by the court uh, to violate the basic structure of the constitution. And so a, a constitutional amendment can itself be unconstitutional. Um, again, I, I will confess uh, I'm not a part of this project because I, I know much about India. I'm a part of this project because I know something about data. Um, so I, 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 I defer to my co-authors whenever something about what's, you know, the, the, the institutional details uh, of, 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 um, of doctrine and um, and legislation uh, uh, come up, but a little bit has has rubbed off on me. So I'm 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 uh, I'm uh, conveying to the best of my knowledge my understanding of uh, of these details. Yeah. So. Uh huh. I didn't hear you say anything about backlogs or delays, mm -hmm. and that seems to be kind of what we think about when we hear about the Indian court system. Yes. Yes. Uh, how does that fit into these institutional design choices you're thinking about? Yeah. Um, so, uh, speaking of backlogs and delays, we're running out of time, so I apologize for delaying you. Um, so, I'll try to quickly answer the question. Um, so, that, that is a huge part of the narrative of the Indian courts, is that, is that there's, they're, they're crammed with cases, there are long backlogs. Uh, you know, you ask the lower court judges, they say it's the Supreme Court's fault, the, the Supreme Court is where all the delays are. Yes, Supreme Court justices, they say all the delays are in the lower courts. You look at the data, it turns out the delays are kind of evenly spread along all levels of the court system. Um, you know, so, but, but I, 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 having said that, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the average case in our data from soup to nuts is taking, you know, 10 or 12 years to get through the system. Um, on the, you know, but, but, in, but I, I don't want to blow that out of proportion because if you only look at Supreme Court cases in the United States, they're going to look like they take a really long time as well, right? Most cases in the federal court system only take, you know, one to three years. Um, but of course, conditional on getting all the way to the Supreme Court and being litigated to judgment, they're going to take a lot longer than that. So, you know, we're not exactly seeing a, a truly representative sample of cases that aren't getting to, you know, that, that are the, the, the rest of the cases, not the ones in the Supreme Court. But at least among the ones that are in the Supreme Court, yeah, they're taking a really long time. And, you know, the thing that I worry about is the court is taking each year more cases than it is deciding which means over time you have a backlog that is now into the tens of thousands of cases that have been admitted for merits hearing and that have not been decided by the Supreme Court. And so when we see that in our data it takes three or four years to get from admission to decision, that's among the cases that have been decided. The cases that haven't been, I don't know how long those cases have been waiting. So I mean that is a, that is a, 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 real, a real issue. Um, so I think we're out of time, but thank you very much. <laughs>